Lady Astor presents the Screen Guild Players. The Lady Astor Screen Guild play tonight, Flesh and Fantasy. The starring players... This is Ella Raines. And this is Charles Boyer. Tonight, Lady Esther presents the Screen Guild players in a strange and provocative story from the universal picture Flesh and Fantasy, an absorbing and romantic expedition into the world of dreams. It stars Charles Boyer as Paul Gaspar and Ella Raines as Joan Stanley. familiar thing to me. The drum beat as I stepped out on the wire, the crowd, the faces filled with fear. I had gone to accept them, to take them for granted. I was relaxed, poised, sure of myself. I was the great Gaspar until I had a dream. That night, we were playing our last performance in London. I was in my dressing room. There was still some time before my act would be called, so I stretched out on my couch and I fell asleep. I fell asleep and I had a dream. The old familiar thing. The drum. The sea of faces looking up at me. Only something this time, something was different. One face stood out from all the rest. A girl. A lovely girl who wore... Two diamond earrings, shaped like tiny harps. Her eyes were filled with fear for me. And suddenly, I felt that fear myself. The wire blurred. I swayed. I lost my balance, and I fell. And as I fell... <coughs> Mr. Casper! Mr. Casper, sir! Huh? Oh, sir. What's the matter? Huh? You have a dream, sir? Oh, yes. Well, you, you're on in five minutes, Mr. Casper. Shouldn't I ought to brush your coat off? Oh, please. Yeah, we we all have dreams, sir. Mm. Like the time I dreamed, my wife had up and left me. <laughs> I sure was happy till I woke up. <laughs> but there she was. Uh, your hat, sir? Oh, thanks. What was you dreaming about, Mr. Casper? Hmm? About a girl. That sure is bad. <laughs> but you have a hard time catching up with you in the circus. Here today and gone tomorrow. That's how circus folks ain't it, sir. Yes, 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 I suppose it is. Hello, Gaspar. Hi, Paul. Oh, that's 
funny. I didn't even bother to answer. What's eating him tonight? Well, you know these artists. Temperamental. Well, Paul, you certainly got an audience tonight. Every seat gone. <laughs> now you ought to bill every performance as the last. Make them flock in here like... Uh, what's the matter, Paul? Don't you feel well? Eh? Oh, I'm all right. I, <laughs> I had a dream just now. What kind of a dream? Well, I, I dreamed that I fell from... You fell? You mean while you were up on the... Paul. Paul, what's wrong? You've never paid much attention to the crowd. Who, who are you looking for? Eh? Oh, nobody. Well, now, look, Paul, if you don't feel you... No, no, I, I told you I feel fine, Emma. Uh, there's my cue. I'll see you later. <laughs> Jump. I don't know. He's been acting kind of funny tonight. Lamar, do you think he might... Shut up! Oh, look. He turned back. He lost his nerve. Oh, make him come down, Mr. Lamar. Call the next number. Start the ballet. Go on, get out there. Step on it, will you? Everything was going round and round. I couldn't even see the wire. Well, maybe you think I'm crazy, Lamar, but you didn't dream it. Face down, down, conscious all the time. Eh, must have been rough. Well, we're all a little on edge. We had a close shave, Paul. You don't know how close. But all I could do to make the platform, work for years to get where I am, and now this. My whole life, twisted by a dream. You, uh, you think there's anything to it? Uh, maybe there is, maybe there isn't. I have to be wrong only once, you know. I can hear her screaming even now. Hear who screaming? The girl. Oh, that's right, I didn't tell you. There was a girl in my dream. I could see her so plainly, all the way down, screaming... And those diamond earrings shaking as if they were alive. As if they wanted to scream, too. Well, Paul, I I ain't holding for or against dreams. Some come true, some don't. <laughs> the worst that can happen to me, I fall out of bed. With you, it's different. Yes. And you're the star of the show, and I don't want to lose you, Paul. But I don't want to lose you the hard way, either, so uh, here's the setup. If you feel you can lick this dream stuff, you can do your act. Or you can do it with a net. Or, if it's still got you, you can go back to your old act. My old act? Now, look, we're, we're sailing for New York tomorrow morning. <laughs> you can think it over on the boat. That's uh, pretty good food they dish out on his boat. Sure is. Pass the cream, will you? I wonder where Paul is. I've hardly seen him since we sailed. He's been keeping pretty much to himself. I guess he's still shook up by that dream. You think he is? Sure. Dreams can tie you up in knots. I've got a girlfriend who had a dream she was chased by an ape. That wasn't a dream. Huh? Every girl, if she's got anything, is chased by an ape sooner or later. That Nick's Nick here comes falling out. Good evening. Oh, uh, hello, Paul. We were just talking about dreams. Were you? Yeah. I was reading in a book called Fruit, where all dreams... It's Freud, not Fruit. Huh? And that's the name of the author, not the book. Oh. Isn't it, Paul? Well, maybe you had a split personality. I dreamed once I was going over Niagara Falls in a barrel. Well, did you? Did I what? Go over the falls in a barrel. Sure. How long after you had the dream? It wasn't after, it was before. Oh, I see. Well, if you don't excuse me... Where are you going, Paul? Out on deck for a walk. <laughs> That night, out on the deck. We were running through fog in a heavy sea. I gripped the rail as a great wave came over. And as it washed away. I, I beg your pardon. You. It is you. The girl in my dream. Let me go. No, no, please. Don't be frightened. I'm the one who should be afraid. I'm sorry. It's very rough out here in this lake. I'm going in. Good night. Oh, no, wait. Now, one moment, please. Try to remember. Haven't we met somewhere before? Never. And if you don't go away, I'll call for help. Well, in the circus, perhaps. I'm a performer, an aerialist. Uh, my name is Paul Gaspar. Maybe you've seen me. I haven't been to a circus since I was a child. Oh, well, then somewhere else in London, Monte Carlo. Please, try to think. I tell you, we've never met. But in Paris, then. Barcelona, Naples, Cairo. Somewhere. That would explain everything. I've never been to any of those places. Well, then, then it's even more wonderful. Oh, you're certainly giving an old act a new twist. Wonderful. Oh, now, please. No, 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 it's true. We have met before. 
If not in this world, in this life, somewhere. Look, I saw you night before last in a dream, as clearly, as vividly as I see you now. I was doing my act on the wire. I fell, and you screamed. Do you understand that? I fell. <laughs> and yet, here I am, and here you are. You're, you're just imagining things. But your earrings, where are they? You, you had them, of course. What earrings? What are you talking about? I saw them, even while I was falling, shaped like two little harps, jewels flashing in the floodlights, as if they were alive. Who are you? What do you want? What are you following me for? I'm not following you. We just met. You had the earrings, haven't you? No, it's, it's none of your business. But you believe me now, don't you? Oh, why should I? After all, it was only a dream. It might have been any girl. Oh, but the earrings, Miss... Stanley. Joan Stanley. I, I, I don't know why I should tell you. Joan. Look, if you really saw me in your dream, I should think you'd want to avoid me. I should, shouldn't I? Of course. I might bring you bad luck. Yes, but it's such a charming risk. Good night. Until tomorrow, for dinner? I believe that all I said was good night. Cocktail, Paul? No, no, we'll wait for her. I want you to meet her, Lama. I want you to see for yourself. Tell me, how do you know she's the same girl? The earrings. But uh, maybe she was telling her the truth. Maybe she hasn't got them. She has them. How do you know? I know. And you're sure she'll have dinner with you? Sure. But you told me she said she wouldn't. Three times. The third refusal was final. She'll be here. Mr. Gaspar? Oh, here, Stuart. A note for you, sir. Thank you. Not at all, sir. You're quite welcome. Hmm. Is it from her, Paul? Who else? What does it say? Uh, there is no use waiting... I cannot dine with you. Well, that settles it. Huh. You mean she won't come, huh? I mean, she's expecting me. I'd better go and get her. No, go away. You can't come in. Oh, for just a moment, please. I said you couldn't come in. Well, you're late. You know, I, I wonder if anything had happened. Didn't you get my note? Yes. I, I thought you might be foolish enough to expect me. Oh, it was good of you to think of me. My goodness, you must have traveled a lot. All those tags on your trunk. Perhaps it's not my trunk. Perhaps not. Shall we go? I told you I wasn't going to dine with you. But you're dressed, and you were thinking of me. I always dress for dinner. Besides, I might bring you bad luck if your silly dream means anything. Hmm? My dream? Oh, yes, yes, I remember you. It was in Monte Carlo. I said to myself, what a beautiful girl. How nice. Too bad I've never been to Monte Carlo. No. Eh? No. But the label's on your trunk. I didn't say it was my trunk. Oh, it's strange. I remember the scene so perfectly. But I may be wrong about the place. Maybe you're wrong about the girl. Oh, no, no, no. Now, let me see. Where could you have been... Only in your mind? Ah, that comes later, and it lasts forever. Oh, you are amusing. You're delightful. Thank you. You know, you're rather nice yourself. You uh, almost tempt me to reverse my decision. Then you will dine with me? Oh, but I warn you, I'm going to wear my earrings. The... Your earrings? I've never worn them before. Here, would you like to see them? Shaped like tiny harps set with diamonds. You were so sure I had them. Yes. Yes, I was sure you had them. I was sure. Second act of the Lady Esther Screen Guild play will follow in just a moment. But now a word from Lady Esther. I have some real news to announce tonight. Now for the first time, there's one shade of face powder intensely flattering to four different types of skin. One shade that almost anyone can use, that instantly dramatizes practically every skin it touches. It's called Bridal Pink. 
It's based on an entirely new and different principle in color blending. Whether your hair is brown, black, auburn, or blonde, bridal pink will instantly intensify your particular coloring, will bring out all the life and warmth of your skin, will give you a more youthful, a more vivacious look. Women who've tried bridal pink write and tell me there should be new superlatives in the English language to describe the beauty it gives the skin. Lady Esther Bridal Pink takes away that yellow, faded look, so aging to the appearance. It makes you look as though you've just come from a long vacation, so fresh and alive, so full of young vitality. You can't possibly go wrong if the shade of powder you choose is Lady Esther Bridal Pink. Never before has there been a shade that so instantly wakened and beautified even a dull, sallow skin. And it's so simple, so pleasant to apply. Just pat it gently to cover all your face and neck, that's all. But what a sudden, delightful transformation in your appearance. The demand for bridal pink has exceeded all expectations, and your druggist may be sold out of it. You may have to try several stores before you can get it, but keep on trying. Ask your druggist to order it for you. Accept no other shade, for remember, you can't possibly put Lady Esther bridal pink on your face without instantly looking younger and far more fascinating. And now, Lady Esther presents the second act of Flesh and Fantasy, starring Ella Raines and Charles Boyer. Yes, two little diamond earrings. Exactly I had seen them in my dream. I tried to tell myself it wasn't true, it was a trick. My mind was playing me a mere coincidence. And as the days went by, I managed somehow to convince myself. Joan helped. Oh, she helped a lot. She dined with me and walked and laughed. Until I thought so much of her, I had no time to think about myself. But soon, too soon, it was our last night out. And suddenly she was not laughing anymore. I remember... We were standing by the rail, and after a long time I said to her, Joan, you look so sad. What are you thinking about? About you. Oh, does that make you sad? Yes. Why? I don't know. Perhaps I... Hmm? Perhaps what? Perhaps I was wishing we'd met sooner. Why do you say that? Is there someone else? You mustn't ask. Why not? Don't you think I should know? Paul, we land tomorrow. The end of the journey. Of course, the end of a journey, but not the end of us. Tomorrow we'll be in New York together, darling. No. I won't see you after tonight. Joan. Oh, it's been wonderful, Paul, but tomorrow it ends. But you don't mean that. You can't. It's a... I do, but... I do mean it, Paul. It's got to be that way. Well, if you want it so. Perhaps it's better. I'm afraid for you, Paul. Remember... I wasn't all of your dream. No, but perhaps I wasn't falling at all, but just rushing through time and space to find you. Perhaps that's what the dream meant. Joan, I've got to know. Please, let's not spoil our last moments together. Let's talk and laugh and... Miss Templeton. Oh, Miss Templeton, I didn't know you were aboard. I'm afraid you've made a mistake. Well, don't you remember? We met in Cairo at Shepherd's. I'm sorry, I've never been to Cairo. Oh, I, I beg your pardon. I, I was absolutely sure that we had met before. I, I didn't mean it. Joan, you're not hiding anything from me, are you? Good heavens, you don't think you're the only man I've ever had a casual flirtation with. But I didn't mean to offend you. Well, I... then let's forget it. Joan, is that the truth? Do you call ours a casual flirtation? I didn't say that. Is it? Well, we certainly met casually enough. It uh, doesn't sound like you, Joan. I'm afraid that man from Cairo has disturbed you. I don't know why you're asking all these questions. I'm not asking you any questions. I want... You are, and I won't stand for it. We've had what we've had, and that's all there is to it. I'm going in. Good night. And so she went. After a long while, I turned and found my way back to my cabin. I lay awake for hours that night, 
But finally I fell asleep. I fell asleep and had another dream. It seemed that we were at the pier in New York. There were the usual crowds, the usual noises. And one thing I remember very clearly, they were lowering the lion's cage from the ship. I was looking for Joan. I felt I had to find her. And suddenly, I saw her in the crowd. But just then, two men stepped up to her. And one of them had a pair of handcuffs. And he said, Uh, Miss Templeton? Yes? You are Miss Templeton? What is it? Funny we should find you here. Come along. Wait! 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 Mr. Gaspar, Mr. Gaspar, sir. Eh? What? What? Oh, yes? Who is it? Uh, Stuart, sir. I was passing and I thought I heard you call, sir. Oh. Oh, no. <laughs> no, thank you. I, I was dreaming. You all right, sir? Eh? Oh, yes, yes. I'm all right, sir. I'm, I'm quite all right. Custom office on the right, please. Custom office on the right. Paul? Oh, Joan. Oh, Paul, I've been looking for you. I wanted to tell you how sorry I am about last night. I didn't want you to leave without letting you know. Oh, that. Oh, I've forgotten all about that. Joan, we are friends, aren't we? Of course. No, I mean, if I can help you. If in any way you need me. Oh, thank you, Paul. Goodbye. No, no. No, no, wait. Wait. For what? Well, look. They are loading the lion cage, just like in my... Oh, Paul, you're as excited as a little boy. I'm sorry, I've got to hurry now. Why? Are you expecting somebody? Just some relatives. Goodbye. No, 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 no don't, don't go. You mustn't go. Why not? Well, I mean, I, I can't let you go, not yet. I'll walk out to the street with you, just in case. In case of what? <laughs> well, I don't know. Let us say, in case your relatives forgot. <laughs> See? Well, I was lucky I came along. Your relatives did not even show up. I think I'm the lucky one. No relatives, no friends, no foes. Nobody came. I'm all you have left. Paul, this is goodbye. I'm going to hail a cab, and when I drive no, away... No, darling, I know Little Bar on 52nd Street. Can you make it for lunch at one? No, Paul. Cocktails, then, at five. No, Paul. What about dinner? Say, eight o'clock. No, darling. Well, at least you come tomorrow night for the opening. Oh. You seem so cheerful. I am. Have you ever been happily disappointed? Did something happen? No, something did not happen. That's why I'm... Oh, uh, uh, Paul. Oh, it's Mr. Lamar. Oh, hello, Miss Stanley. Uh, say, Paul, I, uh, well, I... I'm glad I caught you. I I think maybe you ought to rehearse your old act. Oh. You, uh, well, you, you haven't Paul. done it in a long time. Forget it, Lamar. Won't. I'm doing my regular act. I never said I wouldn't do it, did I? Well, that beats me. So you're not afraid of that dream anymore? Will you stop annoying me with your dreams? My dreams? There is nothing to that stuff, Lamar. I've looked into it. Joan, I'll see you tomorrow night. You... you really want me to be there? Well, I insist. Oh, you will come, won't you? I... I don't know, Paul. I don't know. <laughs> Come in, darling. John, you did come. You see, nothing happened. I knew it wouldn't. How? How did you know? Because I had another dream. And you were in it. And that dream did not come true. Now, let's forget about it. Where shall we go to celebrate? 
I can't go with you tonight. But you can't? I've tried to tell you, Paul. I must go away for a while. I have to go. You... You mean someone is coming for you? Trust me, Paul. Believe in me. Believe that I love you, that I'll always love you. It won't be for long. And then, if you still want me... I'll always want you. I had a dream, too, on the boat. Not when I was asleep. The most beautiful dream I've ever had. And maybe it'll come true. If you want it to, it will. I've never wanted anything more in all my life. Darling. You understand, don't you? I must go, Paul. Yes, I understand. I always knew you would go. How? I just knew, and I know that someday we'll meet again, as if for the first time. Goodbye, my darling. Goodbye. Ah, uh, Miss Templeton. Yes? You are Miss Templeton? What is it? We want to ask you about some stolen diamonds. Funny we should find you here. Why? I telephoned to headquarters myself. All right. Let's go along. for an absorbing performance. It was a pleasure to be here, Mr. Bradley. We know how much this radio program contributes to the Motion Picture Relief Fund and its country house. And we all feel it's a great privilege to share in that work. And now, before we tell you about next week's show, here's a word from one of America's best-known beauty authorities, Lady Esther. Thank you, Miss Raines. Ladies, a little while ago, I told you that Lady Esther Bridal Pink is not just a new shade of powder. It's an entirely new kind of powder shade. Bridal Pink ends forever the risk of selecting the wrong shade of powder. Bridal Pink is not for just one particular type of skin coloring. It's flattering to four basic skin types. It has the amazing quality of dramatizing practically every skin it touches. But it's not only the color of Bridal Pink that's so remarkable. The texture of Lady Esther face powder is unusual too as you'll see the instant you apply it. Lady Esther powder is scientifically blended to give a more youthful finish to your skin, to help blend out flaws and hide little blemishes, to erase signs of weariness and fatigue, to cling softly hour after hour, never letting shiny patches show through. The response to my new shade, Bridal Pink, has been phenomenal. For women can actually see the years slip away when they apply it, can actually see themselves become younger looking, better looking. If your druggist is sold out of Bridal Pink, you may have to wait for his next shipment or try some other store. But please don't accept any other color, for remember, no powder shade can give you the happy, radiant look of a woman in love, like Lady Esther Bridal Pink. Next week, the Lady Esther Screen Guild players will present Ramona. It will star Loretta Young and Joseph Cotton. Be sure to listen. Ella Raines appears through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, producers of Walter Wanger's Salome, Where She Danced. Music on tonight's program was arranged and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. This is Truman Bradley speaking for Lady Esther. Thank you and good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight Lady Esther presents the Screen Guild players in a story that is part of the legend of California. Each year, it is performed at a great outdoor festival in Hammett, and each year thousands make a pilgrimage to see it. This year, that pilgrimage has been impossible, and so we bring this story to your homes. Lady Esther, 
presents the Screen Guild players in Helen Hunt Jackson's immortal story, Ramona, based on the famous 20th Century Fox picture. And bringing to life those early California days are Ann Baxter as Ramona, Joseph Cotton as Alessandro, and Reed Hadley as Felipe. The Lady Esther Screen Guild players in Ramona. time ago, a very long time ago, and the land was warm with sunshine and with happiness and peace. I remember I just returned from the convent. I'd come home again to the Rancho Moreno, where I lived with my aunt and my cousin Felipe. Oh, what a joyful day that was. They were having a great fiesta for me. All the countryside had been invited, and in the courtyard of the hacienda, many hands and tongues were busy. Pancho, more peppers. Pedro, shell the beans. Carlos, more wood for the fire. A fiesta, as for a princess. She's more beautiful than a princess. Our Ramona is a saint from heaven. <laughs> Aye, Senor Felipe thinks so too. When he looks at her, his eyes are like... Stop the... bleating, you old sheep. Oh, I have seen it ever since she returned from the convent. Turn that spit. You want the meat to burn? <laughs> Young Senor Felipe does not fool me. <laughs> he will have much to confess to Father Salvadera. <laughs> one, oh, one. Senor... Oh, and Senor Morena with him. Now you'll hold your tongue, you old fool. One, make ready. The Indians are bringing the sheep from the hills. Oh, si, Senor. Senor Felipe, will Alessandro lead them again? Will he come in time for the fiesta? Yes, Margarita, in time to sing and dance and maybe to steal a kiss from you. <laughs> <laughs> Felipe, you shouldn't encourage them to mingle with the Indians. But, Mother, Alessandro is more than just an Indian. He's my friend. Ever since we were little boys, we... Alessandro! Alessandro! <laughs> Oh, Alessandro! Senor? Senor Felipe. How are you, Alessandro? Very well, Senor. And yourself? I've never been better. Nor have I ever seen a finer horse. Where did you get him? I roped him out of a wild herd this spring. He's really a beauty. He's yours, Senor. Oh, no, Alessandro, I couldn't. But I'll race you for him. Will you match him against my black three-year-old? You name the term, Senor. My horse, saddle, and bridle against yours. That would not be fair. I have no saddle. Oh, I'll accept that handicap. We'll race tomorrow. Now go freshen up, Alessandro. Tell your men to make ready. We start our fiesta within the hour. So? Oh, oh, do you like you, Ramona? I'm so glad. Ramona? Yes, Felipe. Oh, for shame. You spend your time with girls while we men die of loneliness. Oh, I had to give them their presents, Felipe. Come, we'll join the company. They're all here, Ramona, for 40 miles around just to greet you, to dance with you. I must admit I'm a little jealous. You? Jealous? Why not? You're the gentlest, the kindest, the loveliest, oh, the... such a pretty speech. You should say that to your sweetheart. I am saying it. Felipe, you're sweet. I missed you so. All the time I was at the convent, I kept wishing I was here, home with you. Ramona, darling. I couldn't love you any more than I do, not even if you really were my brother. Your brother? But Ramona, listen, there's, there's something... But Felipe, they started the dancing. Come along, we'll have to hurry, darling. I've saved the first one for you. Felipe and Ramona, they dance so beautifully. Don't you think so, Signora? Father Salvadera, I need your help. My help? I'm afraid. Ever since Ramona came back, the way Felipe looks at her, I never dreamed anything like this would happen. Yeah, then you've been blind. Felipe has loved her ever since they were children. I'm sure he hopes to marry her. I'd rather see him dead. Senora! I want to look at my grandchildren without shame. Senora, you remember your oath? How you kissed the crucifix in your dying sister's hand and promised to care for Ramona as if she were your own? I remember, Father. And I shan't break my promise. But neither shall she marry my son. Felipe, who is that? The one who 
I'm singing. That's on the song, Head of the Shepherds. His father was a great chief. He sings so beautifully. So beautifully. Wait until tomorrow morning when they march to the chapel. Then, Ramona, then you will hear Alessandro sing. And I used to dream about it. The servants, the Indians, the whole household marching together, singing. The padre blessing the rancho as they crossed the patio. The chapel bell, the altar boys in white, the shrine piled high with spring flowers. And the music, the music. The sunrise hymn. Heavenly, heavenly morn. I kneeled, and all about me I could hear that voice, the shepherd singing sweet and clear. Slowly as in a dream I turned, his eyes found mine, and something strange and holy passed between us then, until it seemed that only we were there, we two alone, we two before God. And then the mass was done, and all was gay again. Padre, you must come to the race. A good race deserves a blessing, too. Who rides today, Juan? Felipe and Alessandro, horse against horse. That morning began so happy with us. The entire household, everyone was there, excited and eager for the race. And now the two riders took their places. Now they look for the starting signal, and now... Hello! The two of them so closely matched, neck and neck across the field, shoulder to shoulder at the halfway mark. Not an inch between them as they made the turn. Now they were headed back, both riding hard and clean, both laying on the whip until... Felipe! He's down! Felipe is down! He's so quiet, so still. He's dead. No, senorita, he lives, but we, we must get a doctor quick. Where? San Diego. San Diego, that's a full day's ride. I will hurry, senorita, I promise you. <laughs> Perhaps it was the promise that he made. Perhaps it was our prayers. In less than 20 hours, he was back. The doctor with him. At Felipe's side. Uh, I thought he'd kill me and the horses, too. 11 hours in the saddle. Only stopped to let the horses drink. But, Felipe, doctor, can you... Oh, I'll pull him through, senorita. He'll live. <laughs> You must be very tired, Alessandro. Yes, a little. Oh, and you haven't eaten. I'll get you some food, some bread and milk. <laughs> Let me, senorita. Why, Please. what should... It's the very least I can do. If it hadn't been for you, Felipe would have... He might... We'll never be able to thank you enough. Senor Felipe is my friend. Could, could you send me word, perhaps, how he is getting along? I will be at the Ortega Rancho. Must you go to the Ortega Rancho? Well, my men are waiting for me there. Well... The, the doctor says Felipe will be sick a long time. Uh, I know that he would want you to stay until he's better. He is very dear to you, Senor Felipe. Oh, yes. If anything ever happened then, to him... if you want me to, I will stay. All these weeks I've watched her, Marta. She has not fooled me for a moment. Every place he goes, she is always there. Why not? Ramona has always been in love with Felipe. I did not say Felipe. It is the Indian, Alessandro, Margarita. But I can tell you now, it will do her no good. Soon Felipe will be well, and Alessandro will go. Be still. He'll go. Those Indians are all alike. He'll vanish like the snow on the hills. You wait and see. <laughs> You mean you're, you're going, Alessandro? Senor Felipe is well. I am finished here, and my people need me. Is it so much nicer there that you'd run away from us? 
But it's very different from this, senorita, but the land has always been ours, and there are cattle and sheep for everyone. Yes, I know. Father Salvadera says it's very beautiful. Temecula. Even the name is beautiful. We are content with what we have. We live at peace with everyone. When are you leaving? I had planned to speak to the senora today. We... We won't see you again for a whole year. No. It will seem very strange without you. I... We'll miss you. Senorita, there are tears in your eyes. Are there? Why, cry? Because you're going away, and everything here will be empty. Senorita, I am an Indian. Sandro. Then I can tell you what is in my heart. Oh, how I've waited to hear you say it. Since that first morning, when you sang the sunrise, and I said to myself, he's singing to me. I was, I was. This is what I wanted, Alessandro. This, only this. Ramona. Senora. Marina. Ramona, go to your room. Senora, please, let me, let me explain. Go get please. your pay and leave the round show at once. I should have known better than to trust an Indian. Ramona, you can't mean it. It isn't possible. It is, Felipe. I love Alessandro. I'm going to marry you. I won't let you disgrace the name of Morano. I'm not a Moreno. You've been brought up as one in my house, as my daughter. Though I knew that someday your mother's blood would show. You speak that way of my mother. She was your own sister. She was not. She was an Indian squaw. Mother, what are you saying? I never told you. I tried to spare you both. Senora. You were born to someone my sister loved deeply. When he was dying, he brought you to my sister. And when she passed away a little later, she made me swear to raise you as my daughter. My mother was an Indian? Yes. And I belong to Alessandro's people. Your father died thinking he had saved you from that. It doesn't matter. You will never set foot in this house, in any respectable house again. Cut off from your own people, no friends, an outcast, no one to turn to. Because to all decent people, you'll be a squaw. Does that matter? Nothing matters. Nothing. Except that I belong to Alessandro. The second act of the Lady Esther Screen Guild play will follow in just a moment. Now, a word from Lady Esther. Have you the courage to look ten years younger? Have you the courage to look so much lovelier and more romantic that all eyes are attracted to you as though by a magnet? Women say my new shade of face powder, Bridal Pink, does just that. They say they can actually see the years slip away when they apply Bridal Pink. They can see the faded yellow look vanish from their skin. See it take on a quality of beauty and radiance that's truly like a magnet, attracting all eyes. Does that sound like an exaggeration? Well, the fact is, women tell me words just don't exist to describe the effect of Lady Esther Bridal Pink on the skin. They tell me it's simply fascinating to watch the change take place in their mirror. And here's the most important thing about Bridal Pink. It's not just another powder shade. It's a new kind of shade based on an entirely different principle in color blending. Bridal Pink is not for just one particular skin coloring, but for four basic skin types. You can't possibly go wrong if you choose Lady Esther Bridal Pink. It's intensely flattering to practically every skin it touches. Your druggist may be sold out of Bridal Pink because of the unexpected demand for it. You may have to try several stores before you can get it, but keep on trying. Ask your druggist to order it for you. You simply must give yourself the benefit of Lady Esther Bridal Pink, the shade that wakens your whole face to new freshness and life. And now, Lady Esther presents the second act of Ramona, starring Joseph Cotton and Baxter and Reed Hadley. We 
were married that night. Felipe was our witness. And that same night we left for Alessandro's home. Temecula. It was our home now. We lived and worked, and we were very happy. For we were blessed as only those who loved him. Had a great big tail that long. <laughs> Hurry, Ramona, we're hungry. Are we not, a little one? <laughs> if she says yes. So it happened one day. In two years. That he went out to play. Everything we wanted. In the forest. The house, so dark the little one, the land. Soon we'll harvest our first wheat. Then my two Ramonas will have new dresses. <laughs> oh, you like that, huh? <laughs> Hello there. Alessandro. Those two men. White men. Howdy. Welcome, senors. We're just preparing our meal. Will you stay and eat with us? What do you say, Bill? No, I think not. Are you going far, senor? Yeah, yeah, quite a piece. I'm going to San Diego tomorrow. If you stay over, we can ride that way together. Oh, going away, huh? Sell my sheep. I hear that prices are very good this year. Oh, it's a nice little valley you got here. Take a look at that dirt, Bill. Yeah, it ain't bad. Oh, anything will grow here, senor. That's what we heard. Well, we got to get going. Come on, Bill. Goodbye. Stop in again. Alessandro. Yes? Alessandro, don't go to San Diego tomorrow. Why? I don't know why. Don't ask me, but stay here, Alessandro, for me. But, Ramona, you speak so foolishly. It is for you that I must go. We will soon be home again, Alessandro. We can see the village from the yes. top of the hill. Yes, Pablo. Four days is a long time to be away from Temecula. And from Ramona. You think she'll like the present I've bought? Madre mia, who would not like a gift like that? A holy Madonna carved in wood to bless your home, to watch your child. Pablo, listen. Guns and fire against the Just sky. Just over the hill. Pablo, the village. Come on, now, clear out a lot of you. But, senor, this is our land. Temecula has always been ours. Not no more, it ain't. The courts up in Frisco say your grants ain't no good. I'm claiming this land. This is my home, senor. I must ask you to leave it out. And that goes for the rest of you, too. Now, look here, ma'am. The quicker you go, the better it's going to be for you. But I can't. I can't go now. Not until my husband comes. Oh, no. Alessandro. You, senor. What are you doing on my land? This ain't your land. I haven't sold it. Well, maybe not. But I just bought it from the governor. Get off. Get off before Alessandro, I... Alessandro, no. He'd only shoot you. Now, that's horse sense, ma'am. Ain't no use going against the law. You better take my advice and just go peaceable. <laughs> And so we went, our household goods piled in a little open cart. We went and sought for land to make another home. We traveled far, but never did we find a place to rest. For something new and strange and cruel was in the land. You can't camp here. This land is claimed. Keep moving, Indians. You're on private land. This here valley is took. That's just to remind you. Higher we went, and higher still, while our hearts grew heavy with sorrow and with pain. And then at last we were in the hills, in a land we told ourselves the white man wouldn't want. And there, in a driving winter rain, we found the only kindness of all those bitter months. Learning to live in what you folks doing out in such weather, and with a baby. Well, come in, come in. You are very kind to us. Nonsense, this ain't no time to be polite. Look, ma'am, you get right up close to that fire and get dry. Oh, thank you, senora. And you needn't bother with that seniori business. Back Tennessee way, folks call me Aunt Ree. Now, let me take them things of yours and... Bless my soul, a figure of the Holy Virgin. Yes, she always goes with us. I hope we won't be any bother. Who's talking to bother on a night like this? Oh, the little darling. She don't like the rain either, does she? I'm... I'm afraid she's not well. And no wonder... Here, let me have a look at her. Well, what is it? Why don't you tell me? That's a mighty sick baby. You've got to get a doctor. Where? There's one in San Badu. Will he come here? He must come. Well, Ramona, we're Indians. What difference should that make? He must come. He must. You've got to bring him. I'll bring him here, Ramona. 
I promise you. I tell you, it's impossible. Half the town's down with fever. I can't leave now. But if you don't come, she'll die. What do you want me to do? I have a hundred sick to watch. Is it because I'm an Indian? Good Lord, man, I'm a doctor. What do I care who you are? I promised I'd bring you. I promised to mother. I will bring you. I'll make you come. I... I'm sorry, doctor. Well, I'm sorry, too. It's your baby against a hundred. She's going to die. Nonsense. I'll fix you some medicine. That's all I could do if I were there myself. Except pray. the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is... Oh, please don't let her die. She's such a little thing. She's always been so happy, so good, hardly ever a whimper out of her. You know, you've stood beside her bed night after night. You've seen her when her father sings to her, the way she smiles and laughs. You can't, you can't let her die, you can't. Ramona! Alessandro! Ramona, I'm back. But the doctor, you didn't bring him. He's coming later. Alessandro, whose horse is that? Oh, I, I borrowed him along the way. My horse went lame. Yes, but... I'll take him back later. It'll be all right. Here, get me a bowl and water quick. The doctor gave me something to make a poultice. There's very little water left. Enough to start. Keep stirring the powders in. I'll bring more water. Oh, blessed lady, forgive me for my words. Forgive me for the things I... Oh! The doctor... One moment, one moment. In here, Doctor. Where's the fellow rode up here a few minutes ago? Well, he's down at the spring. He... Thanks. Oh, Doctor, wait. The baby's in here, inside. Is there something I can do? I'm his wife. He's, he's getting water for the baby. She's sick, you know. Well, what is it? Who are you? What do you want? Why don't you tell me what... That gun. What are you going to... Oh, no, no. Here's how we treat horse thieves around here. Alessandro! Ramona, what is it? Ah! Alessandro! Ramona. Ramona, listen to me. Try to understand what I say. This is Felipe. You're home again. You've been here for weeks, ever since the good woman brought you. All these weeks without saying a word. Please, Ramona, try to remember. Try to speak. You've nothing to fear. The senora is gone. There's just the two of us now. Just we two and the child. See, I... I brought her to you. For her sake, you must live. Ramona... Listen, it's spring again. Do you hear it now? The sunrise hymn, remember? Remember the last time we heard it together? Alessandro. You do hear it, Ramona. You do remember. Alessandro's song. Praise be God. Felipe. Oh, Felipe. Thank you, Ann Baxter, Joseph Cotton, and Reed Hadley for a memorable performance. And to you, Ann, special thanks for stepping in at the last minute to play Ramona when Loretta Young's illness prevented her from being with us tonight. Well, of course, Mr. Bradley, I love the story of Ramona. And I can say for all of us, we love this program. We all know what magnificent work is being done by the Motion Picture Relief Fund and, and its country house. Work is made largely possible by this Lady Esther Screengill show. And we're all proud to share in it. Joseph Cotton will be back in a moment. But first, a word from one of America's best-known beauty authorities, Lady Esther. Thank you, Miss Baxter. Why my new powder shade, Bridal Pink, is such important news, it's not just because this new shade is so unusually flattering to the skin. Bridal Pink is a new kind of powder shade that ends all guesswork 
and all element of... For this one specially blended shade has the amazing quality of flattering almost every skin it touches. The texture of Lady Esther face powder is unusual, too. Because of the way it's blended, my powder gives a delicate, youthful appearance to the skin. It makes every tiny imperfection invisible, blends out and hides little lines, little blemishes. You look and feel more fascinating the instant you apply Lady Esther Bridal Pink. It's so simple to make this dramatic change in your appearance. All you do is pat on Lady Esther Bridal Pink gently to cover all your face and neck. Then just look at yourself in the mirror. You'll say, why, I do look more interesting. I do look more vital and alive. The demand for Bridal Pink has been far greater than expected, and your druggist may be temporarily sold out of it. You may have to wait for his new shipment or try some other store. But accept no other color. For there is no color that can give you the happy, radiant look of a woman in love, like Lady Esther Bridal Pink. And now, here again is Joseph Carton. These past few weeks, the news has been mighty good from the fighting front. But remember, ladies and gentlemen, they are still fighting fronts. The war isn't over yet, not by a long shot. Save gasoline, save tires, save a soldier's life. Sign up for a carpool today. Next week, the Lady Esther Screen Guild players will present Heaven Can Wait. It will star Susan Hayward, John Carradine, and Walter Pigeon. Be sure to listen. Joseph Cotton appeared through the courtesy of David O. Selznick and can now be seen in the Selznick national production, I'll Be Seeing You. Anne Baxter can currently be seen in the 20th Century Fox Ernst Lubitsch production, A Royal Scandal. Reed Hadley can soon be seen in the 20th Century Fox production, Billy Rose's Diamond Horseshoe. Music on tonight's program was arranged and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. You save enough on the largest size jar of Lady Esther face cream to buy a box of Lady Esther face powder. So remember, ask for the largest size. This is Truman Bradley speaking for Lady Esther, saying thank you, and good night, everyone. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Esther presents the Screen Guild Players. The Lady Esther Screen Guild play tonight, Heaven Can Wait. The starring players, this is Walter Pigeon. This is Susan Hayward. And this is John Carradine. Tonight, Lady Astor presents the Screen Guild players in 20th Century Fox's gay comedy of matrimony in the now and the hereafter, Heaven Can Wait. It stars Susan Hayward as Martha, Walter Pigeon as Henry, John Carradine as his satanic majesty, King Lucifer, and Arthur Q. Bryan as the assistant devil. The Lady Astor Screen Guild players in Heaven Can Wait. <laughs> Oh, please. 
Sub-basement level, auditorium of black mass, executive offices of the powers of darkness, main entrance to the bottomless pits of hell, 30 cent tours through inferno, private apartments of the prince of darkness, the arch fiend, the father of all evil, his satanic majesty, King Lucifer. All out, please. Watch your step. Our housing problem is simply terrific. Really, I sometimes think the whole world is going to, uh, coming to hell. Uh, do sit down, Mr. Uh... Uh, Van Cleve. Henry Van Cleve, Your Majesty. Have you a reservation? No. You see, uh, I didn't know I was coming until Tuesday. I uh, passed on at 9.36 in the evening. Mm-hmm. But you should have called at once. Uh-huh. The number's right in the directory. Mephistopheles 000. Well, uh, I, I, I wanted to stay around a day or so, see what uh, my relatives would say about me, you know. They said only the kindest and most generous things. Uh, that's uh, how I knew I was dead. <laughs> well, frankly, Mr. Van Cleve, I shouldn't even consider your application for admittance. Oh, Your Majesty. However, I like your appearance. You haven't the air of the casual run-of-the-mill sort of sinner. Ah, thank you very much. So, if you can meet our requirements, we'll be only too glad to uh, accommodate you. Uh, would you be kind enough to mention, for instance, some outstanding crime that you've committed? Well, I'm afraid I haven't committed any oh, crime. Really? Oh, in that case, sir. Uh... Uh, but I can truthfully assure you that my whole existence has been one continuous misdemeanor. My dear Mr. Van Cleve, a passport to Hades is not issued on generalities. Uh, but if you'll only listen to me for five minutes, my uh, troubles have been with women. Oh? Beautiful blondes. And uh, gorgeous redheads. Uh, any brunettes? I'm afraid so. Well, then, give out, my boy. Give out. Uh, start at the beginning. Who was the first woman in your life? Uh, my nurse. At the age of 14 months, I used to pinch her. <laughs> uh, where? In the pantry. <laughs> she, uh, she used to meet the butler there, and, uh, well, I was jealous. Then, uh, all through my boyhood, I had a succession of girls my own age. <laughs> Go on. Uh, when uh, I uh, kissed them, I used to drop a beetle or a grasshopper down their backs. You'd be surprised at the results. You don't say. Mm-hmm. Wait, oh, yeah. I must make a note of that. Then, through prep school and college, there were chorus girls, cafe singers, trapeze artists, dancers, etc. You know. Yes. And then, on my 26th birthday, I met Martha. Oh, uh, Martha was something extra special? She was an angel. Oh. She was, uh, she was walking down Fifth Avenue, and I followed her. She turned in at a bookshop. Dropping my hat and coat on a chair near the door, I posed as a Turk and uh, spoke to her. May I help you, miss? Thank you. I'd like to, uh, haven't you any women clerks? Oh, unfortunately not. But you might feel a little easier if I mention that uh, I am the one who is usually chosen by the management to handle the more, uh, uh, delicate uh, situations and... As a matter of fact, they call me the bookworm's little mother. <laughs> well, uh, perhaps I'd better go to some other shop. Oh, no, 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 please. My employer is watching, and if he sees no, uh, well, if he should see me losing a customer, it might cost me my job. Oh, well, well, perhaps I can buy some other book. But uh, why another book? You must have confidence in your book salesman. Regard him as your uh, literary confessor. Now, uh, please, speak freely. Well, uh, the title of the book is... Yes. <sighs> It's, it's over there, between to have and to hold and when knighthood was in flower. Between, uh, uh oh, 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 yes, here we are. The Bride's Guide or How to Make Your Husband Happy. Uh, thank you. How much is it? I, uh, probably should apologize. I imagine I should have called you, madam. Well, no, it's still miss. But, uh, not for long, I presume. That's quite right. Uh, How much is the book? Oh, uh, we would be only too glad to charge it now if you will be kind enough to give me your name and address and uh, telephone number. Well, I haven't much time right now, so please will you just tell me how much is the bride's guide, if you don't mind. But I do mind. Look, just imagine that I'm the man you're going to marry. I couldn't imagine any such thing. Well, what's the matter with me? I'd rather not discuss it. I just came in here to buy a book, that's all. I understand that, but but just for the for the sake of argument, let's say that we're getting married. Believe me, I don't want anybody to tell you how to make me happy. All I want is a book. The greatest gift you could bring me is to be just as you are. Adorable. Just one book. Stubborn, eh? And if you don't change your attitude, I shall complain to your employer. I'll uh, let you in on a little secret. I'm not employed here. What? I'm not a book salesman. Then what are you? I'm a man hopelessly in love. I followed you here in the store. The very idea. And if you had walked into a restaurant, I would have become a waiter. If you had walked into a burning building, I would have become a fireman. If you had walked...
Mm-hmm. Very interesting, Mr. Van Cleve. Tell me, where did she walk? She walked out of the store, and I followed her, and she called a policeman. Now, uh, while I was explaining, she disappeared, Your Majesty. Oh, come, 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 my boy. What the heck? Just call me Satan. Uh, did you see the young lady again? Yes, uh, that same evening at uh, my birthday party, as a matter of fact. It was there that I learned her name was Martha and that she was engaged to my cousin Albert. I hope you're not wasting my time and that this fable has no uh, immoral. Go on, Mr. Van Cleve. Well, uh, finding out she was engaged to Albert was a bit of a shock. But later that evening, I went into the library and found Martha there alone. I didn't wish to frighten her, so, uh, well, I just walked right over and kissed her. Please, you must never do anything like that again. Cousin Martha. I'm not your cousin Martha yet. I hardly know you. Why, even Albert, my own fiance, never dared to. Kiss you? Of course he's kissed me. We're engaged. But he never kissed me like that. By the way, do you love Albert? I'm marrying him. Are you? He's a fine man. He's good. He has integrity. He's full of high ideals. He's full of a lot of things. I'm going to make him a good wife. <laughs> yes, I am. There'll never be a day in his life that he'll regret marrying me. And if you ask me one more question, I'll leave this room and never come back again. Darling, never. Darling, darling. I hate you. Oh, sweetheart. It's dreadful of you to put your arms around me like this. Dearest. And suppose Albert should come in and find you kissing me. Oh, well, if you... Oh, but he won't. Not for ages. He's playing pinochle with father. <laughs> My pretty one, you are going to marry me. But I hardly know you. You don't need to know anything when you love. You're mad. Love doesn't need any introduction. You don't know what you're saying. You must be out of your mind. You love or you don't love. Aren't you ashamed? Trying to steal the fiancé of your own cousin. Do you love me or don't you? Don't, causing a family scandal. Do you love me? Why did you ever come into my life? Do you love me? Yes, I wish I were dead. Darling. You're the most odious person I ever met. You've ruined my life. I'll never be able to look Albert in the face again. Considering Albert's face, you're a very lucky girl. <laughs> Come on now, pack your bags and we'll elope tonight. Tonight? Uh huh. Oh, you beast! You cad! You fiend! You darling! <laughs> mm-hmm. Not bad. Not bad at all, Mister Cleve. Uh, we always have a warm spot in our Hades for a young uh, devil like you. Ah, oh, thank you, Satan. You followed the old routine, of course. Fake marriage license and mock parson. No, no, uh, Martha and I were really married. Huh? Oh, but you uh, made her very unhappy. You beat her regularly. No, uh, I was very kind. You see, I loved her. Disgusting. <laughs> but continue. Well, we had a child, a boy. My home life was so perfect that I had no interest in other women, with the exception of Mimi, Rosalind, Elise, Constance, and Veronica. Aha! It was on my uh, 36th birthday and our 10th wedding anniversary that I learned Martha had deceived me. No. Yes. After leading me to believe that she hadn't been jealous all those years, she up and left me. Dear me, dear me. I uh, followed her, of course. She went to her father's house. In all the years I had known her, I never had any idea that Martha was so stubborn and so uncooperative. Henry... I know your every move. Which role are you going to play for me now? The outraged husband? The poor, weeping little boy? Or the strong, silent, wounded lion who's too proud to explain what happened in the jungle last night? So I am a fake. I am false. I'm cheap. Oh, Henry, please. I know I've brought you nothing but unhappiness. You know that's not true. So we did have some good times together. Ah, huh? oh, some wonderful times. Then what do you want? What did I do? Even a murderer has a right to defend himself. You can't hang, hang a, man a man without, without evidence. evidence. I know. If I only knew what particular thing is in your mind. Have you seen Aunt Panetta recently? Of course I have. Ah, oh, well, that explains it. Explains what? Oh, I didn't mention it to you before because it, well, it was so unimportant. When she saw me, I was having tea at the plaza, and at the table with me was a very pretty young woman. But believe me, there was nothing to it, Martha. I would have come to you and told you myself, but... Uh, but you didn't uh, want to make me uncomfortable, even for one second. That's right, darling. It won't work, Henry. And besides, Aunt Minetta hasn't said one word about you in the plaza. Ah. Uh, uh, Martha, this is our wedding anniversary. Do you realize that ten years ago today, I was almost as much in love with you as I am right now? There you go again. All right, darling, I give up. I know it's all over, but before we say goodbye forever, 
I want to give you a little remembrance I bought for our anniversary. Here you are. Open it up. Thank you, Henry. It uh, isn't much. Only cost $10,000, but I thought you could wear it around the house. Oh, it's such a lovely bracelet. Do you really like it? Oh, yes. It must be much prettier than the $500 one you bought for the other girl. Yes, it's much... Uh, what other girl? You left Tiffany's bill on your bureau. Oh, but, uh, There were two bracelets, Henry. This one at 10000 and another one at 500 Oh, so that's what you've been so upset about. I knew it was just a misunderstanding. Sweetheart, I'm so sorry you had to go through all this only because the jeweler made a mistake. That's what the whole thing is, a mistake. I never bought that $500 bracelet. Well, Tiffany's never made a mistake on our bill before. So you don't believe me, huh? No, dear. All right, I'll prove it to you. Hello? Get me Gramercy 5678, please. Thank you. Oh, darling, I love you. You're the most beautiful, adorable thing in the world. And do you really believe there is any woman good enough to win you away from me? Hello? Hello, uh, let me speak to Mr. Tiffany, please. And if there were such a woman, do you think she'd only be worth a $500 bracelet? You're doing very well, dear. Hello? Mr. Tiffany? Uh, this is Henry Van Cleve. Now, listen carefully, please. I'm sitting here with my wife. She's uh, sitting right next to me, as a matter of fact. Uh, we're having uh, a little friendly discussion. Now, do you remember that $10,000 bracelet I uh, bought for her? Yes. Well, there's a $500 bracelet on the same bill. Now, I've tried to explain to her that I never bought a $500 bracelet, that it's a mistake on your part, and, well, she simply won't believe me. Now, I want you to tell her the truth. Here you are, Martha. Mr. Tiffany will tell you now. Thank you, Henry. Hello, Mr. Tiffany? I do appreciate your being willing to lie for my husband, but it won't work. Goodbye, Mr. Tiffany. Martha. Henry, this must be a terrific surprise to you, but I don't believe one word you say. I'm through even listening to you. Goodbye, Henry. It's all over. The second act of the Lady Esther Screen Guild play will follow in just a moment. Now, a word from Lady Esther. Now that spring is bursting into color and beauty all about us, wouldn't you like to give your face the breath of springtime, too? Wouldn't you like to see your skin waken to new life and beauty? See your whole appearance take on a clean, young freshness, like sunshine after rain? Then try my fascinating new powder shade, Bridal Pink. I'm so enthusiastic about this new shade that I just can't say enough about it. Bridal pink is not just another shade of pink powder. In fact, it doesn't look pink at all on your skin. It has a certain elusive quality that's almost impossible to put into words. The best way I can describe it is that it makes you look as though you've just returned from a long, refreshing vacation. And Lady Esther Bridal Pink isn't for just one particular type of skin coloring like other powder shades. It's blended an entirely new way to be flattering to four basic skin types. It doesn't matter whether your hair is blonde, brunette, auburn, or brown. Whatever your hair, your eyes, your coloring, bridal pink will instantly give life and tone to your entire appearance. It takes all the guesswork out of choosing a powder shade, for you can't possibly put bridal pink on your face without looking younger and lovelier, without looking a lot more attractive. Why, even when you don't feel well, your friends will compliment you, will tell you how wonderful you look when you wear Lady Esther Bridal Pink Face Powder. Your druggist may be sold out of Bridal Pink, but ask him to order it for you or try some other store. Be sure to accept no other shade if you want to see an instant fascinating change in your appearance. And now, Lady Esther presents the second act of Heaven Can Wait, starring John Carradine, Susan Hayward, Walter Pidgeon, and Arthur Q. Bryan. Mephistopheles, zero, double, zero, zero. No, lady, you can't speak to the devil. 
He's in confluence with a Mr. Henry Van Cueve. Well, I can't disturb him till it's time for his afternoon brimstone. You might try with a waiter. For a moment, I was practically speechless, Mr. Satan. You can't imagine what it does to a man when his wife calls his innocent, innocent prevarication a premeditated lie. Ah, oh, yes, Mr. Van Cleve. I well remember the night I took one of the Furies boating on Stygian Creek. But that's another story. Uh, please go on, Mr. Van Cleve. I can still see the scorn on Martha's face and hear her voice as she said those terrible words. Henry, this must be a terrific surprise to you, but I don't believe one word you say. I'm through even listening to you. Goodbye, Henry. It's all over. Martha. I mean it. All right, darling. If that's the way you want it, don't think of me. Don't let my broken life tarnish one small moment of your future happiness. I'm sure you'll find someone else who'll really be worthy of you. I, uh, I suppose you want a divorce. I see no other way. Very well. Uh, what about our son? Well, naturally, I want him. Mm, and I think you should have him. The, uh, the boy should be kept away from me. Oh, no, I didn't mean it that way. Oh, yes, I'm a, I'm a bad influence, and you know it. Well, I don't think the child should be deprived of his father. No, no, he's, he's too much like me now. For instance, do you know what he did the other day? What? He bought ice cream for a little girl. Well, I don't see anything wrong in that. Ah, but the girl he bought the ice cream for was not the girl he should have bought it for. It wasn't? No. The little devil. And when the one little girl found out that the other little girl... Well, that boy certainly got himself into a mess. Oh, but he didn't do anything really wrong. But that's what he tried to tell her. Didn't she believe him? She did after a while. And, well, now she likes him better than ever before. She's a very sensible child. Yes, indeed. But let me tell you, he's a problem. Oh, he's no problem at all. He just makes up his little stories. You know they're little stories, but he wants you to believe them so badly that you wish you could. And finally, well, what can you do? Exactly. What can you do? He's just like his father. Happy anniversary, Martha. Oh, Henry. It won't hurt to forgive me one more time, will it? Oh, darling, I don't know what I'm going to do with you. You talk me out of all my principles and convictions. I keep asking myself why I let you do it. And I guess there's only one answer. I'm ashamed to admit it, but I guess I love you. Frankly, Mr. Van Cleve, we could use a man of your talents down here. You are a most delightful liar. Why, thank you very much, Satan. Not at all, not at all. Care for smoke? Why, yes, I... Oh, oh no, thanks. Uh, mind if I light up? Uh, uh, please do. Mm, thanks. These devilish new lighters. Since the war, we haven't been able to get the good old Lucifer's. Now... Here's our problem, Mr. Van Cleve. Huh? You don't quite fit the requirements we've had to make for entrance here. Really? We're a little short of room, too. Can't get priorities to build, you see. Oh, uh, I might be able to help you out with that, Excellency. I uh, know a chap who has a connection with the black market. Mr. And... Van Cleve, this really burns me up. <laughs> you are addressing the man who originated that cute little device. Oh. The boys and I dreamed of not coming home from black mass one night. Uh-huh. Why, I know a lady in Hollywood who had her tickets and reservations all set. Uh, she was going up there, you know. Yeah. When she accidentally heard about a pair of nylons. Yeah. Uh, but let's get back to your problem. As I say, uh, <laughs> we could use you here if you can just meet our entrance requirements. Think hard now. Think way back and see if you can't come up with something bad. Something really nasty. Well, uh... I was in the cafe one night, and uh, I almost got into a fight with Errol Flynn. Uh, child's play, Mr. Van Cleve. Child's play. Uh, you see, a few years ago, we would have welcomed you with open ovens. But uh, people have been getting so much more sinful lately that we've had to stiffen up our entrance exams. Uh. Why, we had a fellow named Hitler show up the other day whose crimes were so bad we didn't have a punishment severe enough for him. We had to send him away. What did you do with him? Oh, we turned him over to the Russians. <laughs> have you uh, thought of anything yet? Well, uh, would you consider uh, suspicion and, and jealousy? Hmm, well, yes, if uh, we, we might, if they were bad enough. 
Oh, uh, these were very bad. It happened on our uh, 25th wedding anniversary. We were entertaining quite a crowd of our old friends when I noticed Martha had disappeared from the party. I looked all over the house for her and finally found her in the library. I uh, remember saying to her, Our silver wedding anniversary and I find you hiding. I've been looking everywhere for you, Martha. A woman who has lived with you for 25 years deserves a rest, Mr. Van Cleve. You're feeling all right, aren't you? Of course, darling. It's been such an exciting evening that I was just... Just... Just what? Well, I was sitting here all alone being a little sentimental. Ah, uh, yeah. The library. This was the room where it all started, wasn't it? A quarter of a century ago. You were standing there by the window when I came in. Mm-hmm. And then you started walking toward me very slowly. And the closer I came, the more frightened you were. <laughs> Henry, I want to make a confession. I wasn't frightened a bit. You weren't? No, not a bit. I kept saying to myself, what's the matter with him? Can't he walk any faster? You're a fraud. A beautiful fraud, and I love you. Thank you, dear. Uh, who uh, called you on the phone a while ago? Well, no one important. Who was it? Jealous? Of course I'm not jealous. I just want to know whom you talk to and well, why you're so secretive about it. Uh, and another thing. Where have you been these past three afternoons? You are jealous. At last, after 25 years. Thank you, darling. Martha, whom did you talk to? Well, you promised not to make a mountain out of a molehole? I promise. Well, I've been going to see a doctor, that's all. A doctor? Now, don't get excited. But why did you go to see the doctor? Henry, you promised. But what did he say? Nothing, really. You've got to tell me. Is, is it serious? I tell you, it's nothing at all. It's just a little dizzy spell. Listen, I always like that tune they're playing. Come on, let's dance, hmm? Martha. Martha, I demand to know what the doctor said. Listen, dear. If I take five drops three times a day... And if you don't worry too much about me, we'll both live to celebrate our golden anniversary. Now, no more foolishness. Come on, let's dance. Well, I didn't know it then, Your Satanic Majesty, but that was our last anniversary. It was the last time we danced together. There were only a few more months left for Martha, and she made them the happiest of our lives together. Mm-hmm. But you didn't die, Mr. Van Cleve. You must have indulged in a few of the deadly sins. No, I'm afraid not. Well, that's the story of my life, Your Majesty. Now, if you could assign me a room on the cooler side of the house. No, definitely no, Mr. Van Cleve. We have no place in hell for you. You'll have to make reservations elsewhere. But there's only one other place to go. But we have our standards. We cannot accept a demi-sinner. But uh, they won't accept a demi-angel. Mm, that's your problem. Now, if you excuse me. But you can't send me away. You've got to take me. I'll ring the elevator for you. I refuse to go. I stand on my right. Excuse me. <clears throat> Hello. This is old Nick speaking. Oh, Mr. Van Cleve, just a moment. Here, it's for you. Thank you. Hello. Hello, Henry. Martha! Henry, you get right out of hell. Do you hear me? But, darling... You heard what I said. It's full of wicked women and it's no place for you. I know, but... Uh, you know how susceptible you are. And with all that heat, you know how men like you go all to pieces even in the tropics. Martha, w will you please listen to me? I... I have a lovely apartment picked out for us up here in the annex. It's not very large and it's not on the sunny side, Henry. But we can make out for a few hundred years. Martha... Martha, I don't care if it's the annex to the annex, and we have to stay there a few hundred thousand years. If it's with you, just wait for me, darling. I'll be right there. This way, Mr. Van Cleve. Your elevator's waiting. Thank you, Your Majesty. Step wide in, sir. Express car at all levels. Heaven we heights to hell's hot basement. Going down, sir? No, son. Going up. Straight up to Martha. Thank you, Walter Pidgeon, John Carradine, Arthur Bryan, and Susan Hayward for your fine performances with the Lady Esther Screen Guild players tonight. It's a pleasure, Mr. Bradley. We consider our yearly appearance on this program one of the really enjoyable privileges belonging to our profession. We're all familiar with the fine work being done in Hollywood by the Motion Picture Relief Fund and its country house. And I hope that every listener in our radio audience knows about it, too. I'm sure they'll remember that the work is largely supported by these radio programs. And now, 
Before we tell you about next week's program, here's a word from one of America's best-known beauty authorities, Lady Esther. Thank you, Miss Hayward. Ladies, now you don't need to guess about the shade of face powder you choose. Now you don't need to risk buying a shade that's too yellow for your skin or too pink or that has too much orange or brown in it. Such a mistake can be more serious than you may think, for an unflattering shade of powder can add years to your appearance. But there's no such risk, not the slightest risk, when the shade you choose is Lady Esther Bridal Pink. For this new shade is based on an amazing development in color blending. It's intensely flattering to four basic skin types. It dramatizes practically every skin it touches, gives it a lovely, elusive quality that's so young, so feminine. And the texture of Lady Esther face powder is unusual, too. It gives a fascinating, baby-like finish to your skin. It helps to blend out flaws and make little blemishes invisible. It helps erase signs of weariness and fatigue. And it clings softly hour after hour, never letting shiny patches show through. The demand for Lady Esther Bridal Pink has been greater than I dreamed. Your druggist may be sold out of it, and you may have to wait for his next shipment. But do not accept any other color. For remember, no powder shade can give you the happy, radiant look of a woman in love, like Lady Esther Bridal Pink. Next week, the Lady Astor Screen Guild players will present First Love. It will star Arthur Treacher, Peter Lawford, and Shirley Temple. Be sure to listen. Walter Pidgeon can soon be seen in the Metro Golden Mayor picture Weekend at the Waldorf. John Carradine can soon be seen in the Benedict Bogius production Captain Kidd. Music on tonight's program was arranged and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. You save enough on the largest size jar of Lady Esther face cream to buy a box of Lady Esther face powder. So remember, ask for the largest size. This is Truman Bradley speaking for Lady Esther, saying thank you and good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.